Si deseas activar subtítulos en español para este webinar, haz clic en el icono de configuración en la parte inferior de la pantalla del video. Luego, selecciona Subtítulos. Haz clic en Traducción automática. Y para terminar, selecciona en la lista de idiomas Español. Con esto, ya podrás disfrutar de la conferencia en español. Si deseas activar subtítulos en español para este webinar, haz clic en el icono de configuración en la parte inferior de la pantalla del video. Luego, selecciona Subtítulos. Haz clic en Traducción automática. Y para terminar, selecciona en la lista de idiomas Español. Con esto, ya podrás disfrutar de la conferencia en español.
los agricultores, somos los que producimos, los que trabajamos en el campo y los que alimentamos, se puede decir, a las ciudades. Seguimos extractando miel, nosotros seguimos produciendo alimentos sanos. En este momento, donde muchos precisaron parar de trabajar, nosotros productores no paramos para garantir el alimento en su mesa. Eh, no paramos porque tenemos que seguir produciendo la leche. Las cadenas de alimentos no se detienen, pero también nos adaptamos a eso. onde toda a família contribui para o empreendedorismo rural. Seguimos com a siembra para suportar esta pandemia. Eh, produzindo realmente alimentos de, de forma responsável, eh, não só para o hoje, mas também para, para o amanhã. O agro não pode parar. Mais uma vez o agro mostrando sua força. Então quem alimenta a cidade é o campo. Unámonos para poder enfrentar esta pandemia. Que os produtos alimentícios cheguem a toda a população. Não sair de casa, estar em quarentena. Quédate em casa e eu pesco por ti. Vos, quédate em casa. Por mim, por você e por nós todos. Si deseas activar subtítulos en español para este webinar, haz clic en el icono de configuración en la parte inferior de la pantalla del video. Luego, selecciona Subtítulos. Haz clic en Traducción automática. Y para terminar, selecciona en la lista de idiomas Español. Con esto, ya podrás disfrutar de la conferencia en español.
go Ruben. Ruben. Good afternoon. Warm welcome, distinguished panelists and participants. Unfortunately, this afternoon, we just got word that the Honorable Minister for Agriculture, Lands and Fisheries in Trinidad and Tobago will not be able to join us. So we have made alternative arrangements. My name is Ruben Hamilton Robertson, the FAO representative for Trinidad and Tobago and Suriname. And I am your moderator for today's webinar. Colleagues, this is the 10th webinar of the FAO COVID-19 and food systems series in Latin America and the Caribbean. This webinar is made possible through the joint collaboration between FAO and the CARICOM Secretariat. Today's webinar focuses on food production and marketing in a digital era, challenges and opportunities for the Caribbean. The Caribbean's food imports, food production, and overall economy face significant challenges due to potential disruptions and shortages that could be caused by COVID-19. In a recent meeting hosted by the CARICOM Secretary General with Ministers of Agriculture and Development Partners, one of three prioritized areas for action is the establishment of a portal for trade and information exchange for member states and the private sector. This webinar today is of critical importance in bringing us closer to such reality. Distinguished colleagues, today's webinar is also timely and important since it helps to elucidate our new Director General's vision for a dynamic FAO, providing technical support for a better world through digital technology and innovation. Today's webinar is being broadcasted via the FAO YouTube channel and through FAO's capacity building platform. For those participants or you participants who have registered through the FAO capacity building platform, you will be able to obtain certificates for your participation. We invite you to comment on this conference through Twitter with the hashtag hashtag FAO CARICOM webinars and hashtag food production, as well as to follow accounts information at FAO Capacitacion and at FAO Americas. Also, don't forget to leave your queries for our panelists in the YouTube chat. There's also an option if you need to translate to other language you can activate the YouTube automatic subtitle with some simple instructions in the video that was shown. Colleagues, this webinar is scheduled for one hour and we'll have three parts. Firstly, we will have four brief presentations to stimulate thoughts and discussions on the main issues. The second part of the webinar has structured questions by distinguished panel of experts. The third part of the session will be an open session and we will take questions from the audience as posted on the YouTube site. To get through the pack agenda in the limited time frame that we have, I kindly request that all panelists follow the timely assigned um, time frame for your presentation. And I will give a signal when you are close to your presentation so that you are informed accordingly. With this being said, ladies and gentlemen, let us now introduce our first speaker to give the welcome and opening remarks. I present to you our Assistant Director General and Regional Representative for Latin America and the Caribbean, Dr. Julio Berdigue. Over to you, Julio. You are mute, Julio. Mute. You are mute. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you, Ruben. <clears throat> um, it's interesting that we're speaking today about food production and marketing in a digital era. 
this is as if we were having a conversation in the 19th century about agriculture and food production in the industrial era. We're at the dawn of an age. 10 years, 15 years from now, this conversation today will, will be, you know, simply seen as, I don't know, some sort of prehistoric event. In the future, in the near future, agriculture will be digital, food marketing will be digital, food consumption, food processing will be all digital. We're moving into a digital age. This digital age is not at conflict with traditional knowledge, with our traditions, with our cultures. We simply are here because we have a new tool at our disposal. And our interest, our common interest of all of us who are participating in this webinar, of course, is how we can best use this new tool, digital tools, in order to further human development, which is what everything is about. Today's webinar, the 10th in a series, as Ruben already explained, uh, will be in the hands of a very distinguished group of panelists. I want to introduce, first of all, our dear colleague and friend, Mr. Jose Alpuche, CEO of the Ministry of Agriculture of Belize. Welcome very much. It's an honor to have you here, Mr. Alpuche. Also, uh, Ms. Kathleen Caru, founder of Helen's Daughter from St. Lucia. Welcome very much, Ms. Caru. Ms. Danelia Doyle from Farm, Farm Credibly from Jamaica. Welcome. Mr. Karen Bascom, creator of Tech for Agri from Trinidad and Tobago. Mr. Lorenzo Harewood, founder and executive director of Farm Finder Global from Barbados. Mr. Sylvester Cadet, International Communications Union. And Mr. Keith Agoada, co founder and CEO of Producers Market. Like Ruben said, this webinar is conducted as a joint activity of FAO and the CARICOM. I would like to also welcome everybody who's participating in this webinar through the YouTube or the FAO Capacity Building platform. We have close to 200 participants already. And traditionally in these webinars, we have seen that the number grows as we move into the conversation. So without further ado, I turn over the floor to Ruben to start our webinar properly. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Julio. We move immediately into the discussions with the four panelists. And we ask Ms. Kathleen Carew, who is currently the president of Helen's Daughter Organization, to make her presentation. Ms. Carew, you have seven minutes, and I will give you a nudge when you have the last two minutes remaining so that you can wrap up your presentation. Over to you, Ms. Carew. Thank you, Mr. Robertson, and thank you, Mr. Berdige, for the introduction. I would also like to take the time to thank FAO and the CARICOM Secretariat for this opportunity to speak on such a pertinent topic given the times that we are currently in. Um, as previously said, my name is Keithlyn Carew, and I am the President and Executive Director of Helen's Daughters, which is a nonprofit organization based in St. Lucia, which has a special focus on the economic development of rural women. This comes in the form of capacity, capacity development programs such as our virtual ag academy, our mobile information programs, and our e-commerce website, which is called Green Gold. This e-commerce website has fostered market linkages between hotels, restaurants, and supermarkets, and the rural women that we have actually trained. Uh, being that my topic today focuses on e-commerce opportunities and challenges, I have to say that e-commerce, particularly in the Caribbean, has come a long way. But in the agricultural sector, especially during COVID-19, there has been a jump in demand for cashless and contactless services. And there has been an equal surge in agripreneurs providing these services. In St. Lucia alone, for example, we have seen ag agro e-commerce companies sprout in the form of grocery deliver delivery services with companies such as 
quick delivery and shop the Caribbean. And we have seen an uptick in produce delivery services in the example of our own platform, Green Gold, another called Jare Cuisine and Jameson Farms. And obviously we have seen many other similar companies throughout the wider Caribbean. This has been quite timely considering the impact of COVID-19 where food was being rationed and access to produce was limited. Not to mention these services assisted many whose mo movements may have been limited or who lived in remote uh, areas. For me, and what I have honestly experienced experience with e-commerce is that the true beauty of e-commerce in this era is that someone who does not possess a knowledge of coding or web development is still able to build out an e-commerce platform. And that is because of companies such as Shopify and WooCommerce. They're easy to set up and use, and most importantly, these platforms have integrated payment gateways, allowing for all major credit and debit card services to be accepted. Now, touching on St. Lucia, for example, where only 6% of farmers island-wide hold an agricultural contract, whether it is to sell to restaurants, hotels, or supermarkets, these e-commerce solutions bypass the traditional obstacles, and it honestly is a gateway for many marginalized farmers, particularly women farmers, because they can market their products direct to consumer. These farmers can market their products virtually, whether via social media or other platforms such as WhatsApp. And also it enables them to attract younger customers who may not usually visit a vendor's market or those who are more likely inclined to find out where their produce actually comes from. But I think the most transformative feature of e-commerce tools, particularly for the marginalized populations, is the ability for them to receive money virtually. That is honestly a powerful tool because it enables farmers to create a financial footprint. That online tra transaction immediately validates a farmer's business history to a financial institution, giving them the ability to obtain a loan or simply to justify the existence of their business. Now, while I mentioned that e-commerce may be easy to start up in today's era, I think that we honestly forget the back end of an agricultural business. And there are many um, obstacles that are related to agro e-commerce um, businesses. For example, Regionally, I think that one of our major problems is the payment gateways. While e-commerce solutions, as I mentioned, offered virtual financial, offer the solution of virtual financial transactions, most of the payment gateway systems that are being used lie outside of the, re outside of the region. For example, there's a popular um, gateway called Two Checkout, and it is commonly used uh, here in St. Lucia. And when you look at to check out the pricing of it for each transaction to check out is paid probably 3.5 to 6% on each sale in addition to 35 cents to 60 cents per transaction. When you calculate that that is a substantial amount of money leaving the region. Now we have seen payment gateway systems sprouted in Trinidad and Jamaica in the form of YPay but for some reason they have not been easily integrated into small and medium sized enterprises that exist online in the Caribbean. Another thing that I can stress on more, while we have virtual solutions, our back ends need to be strengthened. And that is, for example, the supply chain management. Again, e-commerce is, is a relatively easy way to start up compared to a traditional brick and mortar business, but there is still, again, a need to strengthen the back end. While many smallholder farmers have been able to start e-commerce businesses, many have been able, have been unable to meet the demand, particularly when there is not a harvest projection forecast or an inv inventory system that is integrated into their e-commerce site. So Excuse that- Excuse me, we... Ms. Garou, you have two, two more minutes, please. Thank you. So that, for example, the harvest projection forecast and the inventory system, it allows you to anticipate what is in stock, what is missing, and what can be replaced. Obviously, this is something that, for example, Shop, Shopify, WooCommerce, 
does not provide. So you would, in that end, need a more advanced coding or web development knowledge. Um, finally, I would say that, again, while we have e-commerce solutions, there the common problems that we still face with smallholder farmers, with or without e-commerce, they're still there today. Um, again, with farmers, for example, there's a gap in accessing markets because I've seen in St. Lucia, particularly in COVID, that the larger producers who were selling, for example, to hotels and restaurants, they have now been able to pivot their business models to allow to focus on home delivery systems. In essence, they're cutting out smallholder farmers who are basically limited or cannot meet the, the demand. Um, in the end, as I said, with or without uh, e-commerce, farmers still need the tools to equip themselves, whether those tools come in the form of capacity development training, whether they come in the form of an incubation program, and most importantly, in the form of startup funds, particularly for the most marginalized farmers. Um, I thank you again for the floor and I'm open to any questions. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Ms. Karu. Excellent job. You were able to complete your presentation within time. We move to our second presenter, Ms. Danelia Doyle. She is actually the project manager of Farm Credibly in Jamaica. She has a history of working in the information technology and service industry. Ms. Doyle, you have seven minutes to do your presentation. And uh, after, when you have two minutes remaining, I will give you a reminder. Over to you, Ms. Doyle. Good morning, everyone. It is indeed a pleasure to be here speaking with you today. And I will be speaking about a blockchain innovation initiative called Farm Credibly. And my team and I are working to really transform the relationship between farmers and their ability to access capital. All right, so the problem is credit in agriculture. That's the problem that we're essentially trying to solve. And at the moment, it is difficult for financial institutions to know which farmers are credit worthy which ones are actually farmers, you know, doing the work on the ground, um, having relationships with their suppliers, whether that be farm stores or uh, vendors in the market. Now, how do, how do we as Farm Credibly employ or embody traceability in the digital age is that we are empowering creditors um, with information on their farmers through providing an alternative credit scoring system. Now, we do this via our impact funding investment website. It's our first financial platform that we're introducing, hoping to help farmers get quicker access to finance and how we leverage blockchain technology here is that blockchain provides a leisure. It is a digital footprint. So the investors will be able to go on to our impact investment website and get real time updates about a farmer's farm and what is going on with the state of their investment. And farmers with smartphones will have the ability to show updates on their farms continuing to input information within the system and increasing their digital footprint, which then increases their credit worthiness. Um, in impact investors receive a 20% um, return on their investment on a yearly basis. And this is really a pilot project that we have implemented to test our business model, so to speak, and get our feet wet and we have been getting really good results. We have been meeting with farmers, um, assessing their capabilities, et cetera. Now, a farmer profile will look, uh, I'm not sure if you see my presentation at the moment, but farmer profiles or the beauty of a farmer profile is that farmers will have the ability to show what 
the state of their farm is in. And that is showing with the usage of the platform, we're tracing information such as their years of experience, their expertise, the crops that they plant on their farms and the best practices that they're using. So the information or their ratings will increase or decrease based on how much they're using the system, which again is a way to validate the work that they are doing. All right, as it relates to traceability now, blockchain technology will power a data-driven supply chain for the production of a variety of commodities. Eventually, we're hoping to scale our platform to include farmers all across the Caribbean and a different variety of crops. So currently we have a problem in the food supply chain where we don't know what is happening with the food at different levels of the supply chain. With blockchain, because it provides it's the single source of truth, you will be able to see what is happening with crops from the starting point on the farm with the farmers, when it goes to the processing house, when it leaves the processing house, heads to the exporters, when it leaves the exporters, is in another country. So you'll be able to track different produce from growth time all the way up until the time that it is going to be consumed or when the crop is transformed into a different type of commodity for consumption. And we're talking about food security here and also improving the livelihood of the persons who provide food to basically the entire world. So a part of what we're doing is empowering for farmers, moving them into the digital age, encouraging them to get smartphones, encouraging them to understand their smartphones and to use it to their benefit, um, to help uh, bridge that gap between their access to capital and the work that they're actually doing on their farms. All right. Um, one of the other things that I wanted to just reiterate about um, blockchain technology and why it's also such a transformative tool for farmers looking to access capital is that all of the information is accessed or sorry, disseminated from a central processing site. So there is no one tampering with the information. Nobody can go in and change the information based on any sort of biases. You know, it is completely transparent. It allows for automatic, sorry, automatic pre-qualification of loans <laughs> and also okay. automatic disbursement. Okay, excuse me, please, uh, Ms. Doyle, you have two more minutes, please. Okay, awesome. Right. So farmers are still marginalized. A lot of farmers are still marginalized for, you know, mistakes from the past. You know, you hear about farmers getting funds before and it was mismanaged or crops weren't used in or crops weren't grown in the best way. One of the things that happens now is that farmers are empowered with blockchain to, yes, they will show, their records will probably show that they have a bad patch, but it will also show that they were able to recover. Also, as it relates to the food supply chain, you definitely get to see where the weakest links are within the supply chain and work to improve that particular se sector. And that information will be driven. Well, that is data driven information that would have already been collated and collected on the blockchain framework. Um, so, yeah, that's uh, Farm Credibly. And that's definitely the work that we're doing to not only empower farmers, but definitely to transform the entire agricultural framework within the Caribbean. Great. Thank you very much, Ms. Doyle, for an enlightening presentation. Thank you very much. Without further ado, we move to our presenter number three, Mr. Kiran Bascom who is the founder of tech for agri a company that provides information that relates to technology, innovation, and success in agriculture. He's from Trinidad and Tobago. Let's just welcome Mr. Bascom. Mr. Bascom, you have seven minutes to do your presentation, and I will give you an alert when you have the last two minutes remaining, please. Over to you, Mr. Bascom. Okay. Mr. Bascom is using a PowerPoint presentation. So 
share the screen. Can you see? Thank you. All right. Morning, everyone. Thank you very much for the introduction and much appreciated to, for the invitation to be here as one of the presenters. So, as a quick introduce, I'm asking Peter of Ekpaaki. Um, we have Mr. Basco, Mr. Basco, excuse me, please. I'll give you back your two seconds, but you need to speak a little closer to the microphone, please. Okay. All right. Yeah. All right. Can you hear me better now? Much better. All right. So we, we are our entity. We were the first to start talking about writing and blogging about technology, innovation, and successes in Caribbean agriculture back in 2011. And from there, our, our little business, our little blog grew into a social enterprise. And we now offer services in mobile video production, social media consultancy, journalistic work, and development training. So as a, as a startup, we have had to really build on what we've done, build our skills, really capitalize on the opportunities that are out there in terms of traveling and whatnot. Being as our blog was started internationally, we went that route in terms of growing ourselves. And now we, we are we're almost 10. This July, we will be nine years old and, and next year we will be 10. And it is still a challenge, but we have benefited from the work that we've done. Um, but it is still, you know, we still face many difficulties, uh, something that the other presenters can probably speak to. So just to highlight some of our track record in terms of media, we have basically every year since inception, we have been, we have received some form of recognition. And this recognition typically comes from the international sphere. And this means that you know, we are basically globally competitive. We are able to compete with other entities doing similar things or similar work. And we are always able to find support from our international networks. So that has helped us to grow. So we have been doing this work for quite some time, this digital media, uh, mobile media, We've been doing it for quite some time. But now, of course, because of COVID-19, I was asked to see well, what is happening. And it is very, very clear that there's a massive increase in online and digital communication. You know, people are using their WhatsApp groups. Farmers have realized, you know, as, as Ms. Kitlin previously just said, deliveries are now very commonplace. And so farmers are building their online channels, their online pages. But because businesses like ours, Tech for Agri, have been around for some time, um, these brands, some brands are standing on more than others because some businesses are very much more able to use the technology that we have had. You know, um, yes, we, we are in a new era because of COVID, but the reality is digital work with agriculture, journalism, communication, marketing, media, it's very, very, very commonplace in every other part of the world except the Caribbean. I don't know why that is, but you know, we are here building and building. And you've also seen us consumers and innovators and persons who want to get back to growing, they're very much hungry for information. There's you know, live sessions everywhere, just as FAO and CARICOM are doing their live sessions everywhere. And people are searching for this information. And the thing is, to find structured information concerning agriculture and food production or different brands that are out there, it is, it is limited in a sense. So only those who are very versed at doing this type of work you know, things like SEO, things like social media are the ones that are going to stand out. But in reality, these tools are really beneficial to SMEs and the those that are on the ground to help give them that visibility. Because typically, marketing is a high cost, right? It's usually something that is very costly. However, with Tech Friday, because we are being innovative and using the tools we have on mobile devices, we are able to lower that cost and still 
have that very important structure and storytelling. The ideas for marketing is meant to impact and convert all your followers and all your persons into customers who are paying on a regular basis for your product. And that is missing from a lot of people that are out there that are trying to you know, use these tools that have been using these tools. So I just have a few examples. So on the left, we have one of the newest persons. It's called AgriTiki. And all they are doing is simply taking photos and, and, and pictures that other persons are taking about their agriculture and reposting it on their channel. And it's excuse very me, recent. Excuse me, Mr. Bascom, not to disturb yeah. you, but you have two more minutes, please. All right. It's very, it's very um, new. And we have persons like Market Movers who have used marketing and media to expand their businesses. So they originally just did deliveries as well, but now they do design work the actual marketing. And then you have individual persons like Mr. Hill Brown and the maker that is simply using the tools that are available to him to progress his work. And as I said, mentioned, you know, we have a lot of you know online uses telling for telling stories, for meetings like we are for this one, and for really ensuring that you maintain your audience. So I just have some quick examples, which is basically the end of the presentation. But you can see in the video, you can see another another well-known that really utilizes media well. It's a fool. You see the effort and care that they take. It's important that you see it. And here you have seasonal dishes, which is a much smaller brand. And they are still trying, you know, but clearly there is a difference in quality there. And that it comes out of practice and usage. Um, let me fast forward a bit. So here's another example of of uh, its service. You have a uh, voice of agriculture. It's actually a newspaper here in Trinidad. They and all have taken to digital with their Facebook page and their live Zoom chats and whatnot. So these are things. This is where we are seeing we really have to make that effort. And here's an example here in Trinidad. This is Nam Dev Course. Here, this is the video that they are putting out. And you can see the difference in storytelling. You can see the difference in you know, what is really going to keep the audience. You know, it must be interesting, it must be targeted, it must be structured. And just to close off here is an example of Tech Fabri's work. We are doing a series called Farmers Food COVID, which is literally giving that direct visibility to our local food producers. So we were just being very direct. These are the people that are feeding us. These are the people that you need to support and this is how they function and operate. So I think that's it. So just closing off, as I was mentioning before, it is, it is still limited and still at varying levels because we are literally going through a transition period, but it's still necessary for it, you know? So that's basically the end of it. I mean, if everyone knows what the benefits are, then we should be taking up the services and working with the persons who are working on the ground to execute this work and support our team. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Bascom, for your presentation, sharing practical examples of experiences and lessons learned using the digital platform. Thank you. We now move to our fourth presenter who is Mr. Lorenzo Herewood. Mr. Herewood is the executive director and founder of Farm Finder Global that is in Barbados. Mr. Herewood, you have seven minutes to do your presentation and I will give you an alert when you have your last two minutes remaining, please. Over to you, Mr. Herewood. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Robertson, and thank you for the FAO and, and, and Kerry Com and the panelists for actually um, having me here this morning to make a very valid contribution. I'll jump right into the meat of the matter um, and basically say that if I had to sum up the experience in Barbados regarding foreign finance op operations, I would have to say it was an occasion of serious national consequences in terms of health and economic misfortune um, for the most part, though. However, notwithstanding the fact that lives were have been lost and livelihoods have been seriously disrupted. 
uh, there was also a narrow window which presented opportunities through the crisis to improve operations and livelihoods through agriculture, while at the same time having a bit of fun in the process from the end of Farm Finder. Now, Barbados had its first case in terms of acknowledging COVID on March the 17th, and by March the 28th, through acknowledgement of a public health emergency, we entered a period of what some called a national shutdown, but what was essentially an 8 p.m. to 5 a.m. curfew. This, of course, was reinforced by serious legal provisions which stipulated that contravening the order without a reasonable explanation could result in persons being liable to a fine of Barbados $50,000, one year in prison or both. Now, what followed that particular acknowledgement? We had panic buying, as is customary in this region, not only with COVID-19, but also with the anticipation of declared natural disasters such as hurricanes as well. Um, we also had an access regime based on the last name of consumers, such as, such as the case for me as a Herewood. I would have to go to the supermarkets on Mondays at 1 p.m. and on Thursdays at 8 a.m. and conduct my banking on Thursdays as well. I know this is quite different in terms of Grenada. Uh, Grenada had a regime which was more focused on geographical proximity as well. Um, thirdly, we had a rationing of items to be purchased, similar to some of the, the, the uh, points mentioned earlier, such that in some establishments, you could only take a maximum of two of any particular unique item and overall a total of 40 unique items um, to fit into your trolley. Now, against that backdrop, where did Farm Finder come into the equation? You know, agriculture was thriving through the pandemic and we saw a large influx of persons from other sectors positioning themselves to either one, take advantage of the gains to be made as an additional income source, or two, to partake in selling agricultural produce as a result of being out of a job or being under, under, underemployed um, via salary cuts, which is very prevalent now. We noted that many persons involved in similar sectors, such as fisheries, became deeply involved in selling fruits and vegetables as well. Um, interesting to note as well is that these persons were mainly selling local produce at, at one particular time. Now, in, in response to COVID-19, uh, the pandemic, Farm Finder engaged in two major activities to support the food security structures of Barbados and later to other countries where we have operations. Firstly, we distributed free seedlings. In Guyana, we worked with Food for the Poor to target vulnerable households, mainly housed by women, and provided 40 households with over 4,000 seedlings. In Barbados, it was a more random distribution of 10,000 seedlings to 400 households in collaboration with the National Conservation Commission. Now, the idea behind this was to help advance the notion of kitchen gardens, although back in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, um, this was a standard provision across the Caribbean. Secondly, and most importantly, and the length of this particular um, form that we were in, we created an e-commerce platform for small farmers. This came out of a recognition that even though the sector on a whole was booming and prices peaking, as a result of the level of uncertainty regarding COVID-19 development, some farmers still were not seeing the types of rewards that would naturally that one would naturally expect on this occasion. Now, why is this? Many of the farmers and vendors have fixed location operations and therefore were unable to deliver items that were in demand. We stepped in and we provided the centralized interface where consumers who were largely immobile due to the name-based shopping regime could now access all the fruits and vegetables that they usually enjoy by ordering through our e-commerce platform. We operated and continue to operate this venture guided by a principle that we do not and do not, we do not currently and we will not charge any of the farmers or vendors in terms of um, delivery or procuring the services through our system. To apply a commission to them for this service, we thought was doing the food security system, not only in Barbados, but the region, a grave injustice. Now, this is going to be very important. What are some of the key highlights of this e-commerce venture for Farm Finder? One, strengthen partnership, and there are four of them, strengthen partnership. So partnerships with primary producers like farmers and fishers present a, presents a really firm base on which Farm Finder can create a more substantial and integrated food and agricultural framework, not only for COVID-19, but also for other disaster preparedness, disaster reduction, and disaster response. Two, data accumulation. We are now able to aggregate and analyze key data regarding the demand and supply of various products listed on the platform. Suffice it to say, in Barbados, 85% of all e-commerce transactions through our platform were conducted by Excuse females. me, Mr. Hayward, you have two minutes, yeah. please. Two minutes, okay. Some other yeah. tidbits, meats and fish accounted for 30%, and there are only 2% of lightly processed items like fish cakes and batters. The second achievement, employment. It is not significant but by any stretch of the imagination, but during the COVID-19, we were able to provide four full-time jobs, three drivers and one admin person during a time where job security was under threat. Three, and I want this to be one of the main takeaways, 
This to me, even though it was driven by an inconsistent nuisance called COVID-19, was one of the key developments noted during our e-commerce e experience. Foreign exchange earnings, 32% of sales through our platform came from overseas between April 1st and June 11th. 50% of sales came from overseas over the last 30 days. Within the first 30 days, cash on delivery orders accounted for 85%. And as we stand to be a cash on delivery accounted for 6%. The countries from which we managed to generate foreign exchange during the, foreign exchange during the COVID-19 are Belgium, United States, Canada, Ireland, England, Trinidad and Tobago and Bahamas. Now, interesting to note as well is that this experience has led us to expand a pilot to this, of, the, of this same initiative to Dominica, Kenya, um, we're looking at St. Lucia as well, and we're starting to launch the same platform in East Africa, in Kenya, uh, tomorrow Friday. And we're supported by a memorandum of understanding and support from the United Nations Development Program, and guided by some of the technical expertise from Global Water Partnership. And one of the lessons learned that we, we definitely have to mention before we go is that there is a need for both centralized and decentralized platforms uh, to be integrated in terms of e-commerce because not all farmers, some of them are very technically savvy, but not all farmers will um, allocate that specific time throughout their day to have their own website and their web page and wanted to update, start, update quantities and, uh, and different items as well. Uh, recognizing that farmers also have a strong interest, inherent interest in focusing on food quality as well. Um, so that is my contribution. I could go on for a couple other hours, but I will give way to the master ceremonies at this point. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Yewood, for your enlightening presentation. And that brings us to the end of round one, where we had four very interesting, different, but outstanding presentations. And we now move to part two of the webinar. But before we do, colleagues, I would like to just remind those of us who are following the broadcast through our virtual platform to continue commenting on this conference through Twitter with the hashtag, hashtag FAO CARICOM webinar and hashtag food production, as well as to follow account at FAO Capacitacion and at FAO Americas. Also, don't forget to leave your queries for our panelists in the YouTube chat. At this time, we move to our second round. And as I indicated in my introductory remarks, today we do not have the presence of Honorable Clarence Rambarat, Minister of Agriculture, Lands and Fisheries, Trinidad and Tobago. And so we have asked with the agreement of CEO, Mr. Jose Alpuche, Ministry of Agriculture, Belize, to ask two questions. And so we are going to ask Mr. Alpuche to ask his first question to Ms. Kathleen Carew. Over to you, Mr. Alpuche. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. MC. Uh, Ms. Kathleen Carew and all the presenters, this has been an extremely interesting um, discussion so far. And quite frankly, I want to thank the FAO. I think we really need to, to, to carry this, uh, these conversations a bit deeper. Uh, they're extremely uh, interesting. One, there's uh, gender balance in it. And two, there's uh, young people involved in moving the other side of agriculture forward. So congratulations to you all. My question, Ms. Keatlin Carew, had to do with sustainability going forward. Um, as you rightly pointed out, COVID has created um, a jump in demand, but the question is, uh, how do we keep it going forward as a new way of doing business for agriculture in the region? And how would we incorporate producers, marketers, and where do you see government and the, the uh, parastatal agencies fitting into this uh, new environment? Over to you. Thank you so much, Mr. Alpuche, for the question. Um, I'm actually quite happy that you asked a question on sustainability. And I think that really lies in strengthening the, again, um, the, the farmers themselves, particularly smallholder farmers. I think that right now, um, as Mr. Hayward had touched on, certain producers, large-scale producers are able to um, 
use the market during COVID-19 to their advantage because they've had systems in place and so on. But I think that not only grassroots organizations, but also government agencies need to play a key role in strengthening um, farmers to be able to meet the actual um, demands, the internal market demands of their uh, people. Um, one of the things that I do think is quite important for smallholder farmers is some type of micro grant scheme that allows for financing for um, smallholder farmers to be able to actually receive some type of funding to be able to expand on their farms and so forth. The second I would recommend um, would be capacity de development programs. Um, I'm quite happy in terms of Danilia, Lorenzo, and Kiron being all on here because I think that capacity needs needs to develop be developed in each of these areas. I think one in financial um, in financial and digital literacy, like um, I think it was a Lorenzo who mentioned that while e-commerce solutions may be easy to use, but there are many farm, small farm holders who do, still do not have those skills and are not able to use them. Again, I think while social media is an easy way to market direct to consumer, we have to understand that we also need to build capacity for farmers to be able to do so on their own. Um, and finally, um, aside from micrograms capacity development, I think that we also need to focus again on fostering those market linkages. Um, while there might be an e-commerce solutions, but we need to come into agreements with, for example, certain hotels and restaurants that actually enable farmers to be able to get paid in a, an appropriate amount of time, for example. Um, for supermarkets to perhaps put um, have some type of quota for female farmers to be able to sell to them and, and so on. So these are a few of my recommendations in terms of sustainability. Thank you very much, Ms. Karu. We go to the second question from CEO Alpuche. And Mr. Alpuche will ask this question to Ms. Danelia Doyle. Over to you. And we have three minutes in which to do so, to ask the question and have the response. Thank you, sir. Ms. Daniela Doyle, uh, very interesting work you're doing there. I think uh, traceability has been one of the uh, issues that we found great difficulty in, in conquering, especially from a food safety perspective. What you're doing in terms of uh, both uh, traceability from an investment standpoint, but also too, as it relates to product traceability, could frankly uh, help us solve um, one, of the, one of the biggest uh, issues that we have in terms of growing and exporting. Now, where do you see the banking sector uh, in, 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 certainly in Jamaica, but elsewhere, actually participating in this? Um, you did say that, uh, that there was a need for, for local systems for payment. Um, how do you see this dialogue going forward and a quick solution, early solution, so that indeed the full income generated here um, actually stays uh, in the region, but more importantly, the greater share goes to the farmers? Over to you. All right. Um, thank you very much, Jose. So how do I see or how do we see financial institutions responding to this innovation is the question. Did I get it right? Well, um, at the moment, there is still some apprehension from financial institutions because of their business model and how they go about validating persons to issue loans to them. Um, more more often than not, there is an interest in partnering with Farm Credibly. However, the interest, well, from interest to action is very slow in terms of movement. Everybody wants us to gain some traction first before they, you know, log on to what it is that we are working on. But majority of the feedback that we get is that people are interested but they just are not ready to put their money where their mouth is until there is some proof that what we're purporting actually works 
So in this validation process, we have had um, uh, two financial institutions and two major financial institutions in the island um, give us a mandate of actually passing on farmers information to them who we have already validated as according to their pre-qualifications and also based on the alternative credit scoring system that we are introducing. So we are in the process of um, fitting them with lists of some of the best farmers from our network. And we're thinking that once those farmers, you know, prove to be trustworthy, credit worthy, um, through a program that the DBJ is also facilitating, um, we're hoping that once those farmers have actually validated what it is that we're saying, then more financial institutions will see that as a need or a necessary way or reason to jump on board. But in general, the feedback has been good. Uh, the farmers are interested, the financial institutions are interested, and we could benefit from a little bit more support from them, but we're doing what is necessary right now based on the resources that we have. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Alpuche and Ms. Doyle. Just to say, um, colleagues, we have currently 325 followers which is good. This is a very difficult topic, very new one for us in the region and for our stakeholders, farmers. So we are happy that at least we have 325 followers um, at this stage. And we also have the opportunity to share the webinar via the platforms, which I mentioned earlier. We move to the Mr. Sylvester Cadet to ask his question to Mr. Kiron Bascom. You have three minutes, sir, for the question and response. Thank you very much. Uh, let me first of all say uh, good morning again to everyone. Oh, it's afternoon now. And um, uh, let me also um, thank the FAO for the opportunity to uh, be part of this very, very interesting uh, webinar. I think Mr. Alpuche has uh, captured well the wide range of issues being uh, discuss, so I would not highlight. Uh, but just to say, within the gambit of all the uh, of of all the issues raised, for example, infrastructure, accessibility, affordability issues, digital financing, e-banking, and um, issues related to um, an e-marketplace. My question to Mr. Bascom would be this: that within the Caribbean context, and based on what I've mentioned, the key areas I've mentioned. What are the foremost, the two foremost fundamental pillars for digital agricultural development that you would consider impacting or influencing the agricultural sector in a post COVID-19 era? And why you were these specific pillars that you would choose? Over to you. What is the, what is the word you're using? Pillars? Sorry, I didn't catch that. Pillars, pillars, P I W L E R S. Oh, you mean like uh, factors or like tools that you're referring to? Yes, so I highlighted uh, some key areas just to give um, an insight, like infrastructure, accessibility, affordability issues, digital financing, e marketplace. So, what would be the two foremost fundamental pillars for digital agriculture that you would consider? in a post-COVID-19 era? Well, uh, you have to really consider the main factor that would drive something like that is in terms of what tool you would use is who is using it, who is using it, and for what purpose. So from the trend that we've seen, WhatsApp, which is actually a, communi a simple communication tool, has become very um, key for a lot of small entrepreneurs and small farmers in terms of forming groups, building communities, accessing information. It is very, very, very widespread and at hyper-local level, all right? So that's one of them. And then the, the other thing is you have sort of like a, a tie, I would say, between channels like Facebook and Instagram, even though Instagram is actually owned by Facebook. But the reason being for those is because of their one, they're widespread because you know, billions of users uh, uh, utilize Facebook and Instagram. So, you know, that's where they 
people are where consumers are, but also because they, they both provide a visible, visible something. So they are similar in terms of this, this action, which is scrolling through your cell phone and looking for videos, looking for content, looking for something to watch. And that is the important part. It's like now, especially now, because of COVID, that's what everyone has to do because of social distancing. Have to be either on TV or online. So you, someone is going to be watching. And that content is also easily shareable with the added benefit of mobile and that these tools are on mobile. The sharing is very, very commonplace. You know, so businesses are already getting the information. If they can't get it from your business, your institution or your organization, they will go somewhere else. They will figure it out themselves, right? And the thing is, information empowers. If we're looking for a healthy ecosystem, then you need a structured approach using those tools to facilitate your purpose, which is you know, ensuring that we can feed ourselves locally and regionally. Okay, thank you very much, gentlemen. And we move now to our final question under this um, section, and we are asking Mr. L Mr. Ogada to ask of Mr. Lorenzo Herewood that final question. Over to you, please. You have three minutes. Great. Thank you all for being here today. Uh, it's an honor to uh, be on the panel. Uh, first, uh, the entrepreneurial spirit, which has been exhibited here on the call, is very uplifting. Uh, it shows how the private sector can be a leader in bringing dynamic solutions to our great food challenges and also hopefully inspire more people to become farmers. And uh, my question I have is around solving key issues in connecting farmers more directly to markets. And what we've found is quality control, customer service, and the actual physical logistics can be uh, challenges to reach the consumer from farm gate. Um, how do you see digital technology playing a role in solving these challenges? And uh, what do you think is a scalable solution? Um, thank you very much, Keith. Uh, I, I just really must commend you in terms of the three areas that you, that you mentioned, customer service in particular. I don't necessarily think that um, e-commerce or digital uh, interventions is really going to play a significant role in customer service. That is something that goes beyond um, gadgets uh, or, or blockchain or anything. And I think in particular, my experience with customer service has shown me that irrespective of how wonderful a technology you may have, or ease of usability, um, the human element behind that particular transaction or transactions that you conduct between the producer as well as the consumer that speaks to customer service is an invaluable um, thing, to, thing to mention. With respect to the other aspects that you mentioned, um, logistics is a significant issue for a number of the smallholder, smallholder farmers. And that is where we would have had the intervention where Farm Finder to provide free transportation for the farmers um, to get the produce to the market as well. Um, in terms of scalability of it, uh, based on the example that I gave, we were only starting, we only started in April um, in terms of the um, Barbados market. And now we're actually in Dominica, we're going to be in Kenya in, uh, on Friday. We have everything in place basically. Uh, once you have a proof of concept, that is what we focus on in terms of Barbados, not profit, but proof of concept, but we made a profit during the proof of concept, so that's also good. But once you have the proof of concept and you know that you have the uh, operational aspects in place, it makes scalability much easier because you're just replicating um, a particular model that you have and giving some cultural insights, um, cultural considerations um, to, to the particular aspect. One cultural consideration, I'll give you an example. When we start in Kenya on Friday, we're not going to be using uh, vehicles or we're not going to be using cars or trucks. We're going to be using motorcycles. We're going to be starting in Kasumo County, and that is the primary mode of transport um, over there as well. We're not going to be using pounds. We're going to be using kilograms. So I think scalability-wise in terms of the platform is very easy, but you still have to give consideration to some of the cultural dynamics as well, um, irrespective of where you expand to. Thank you. Thank you very much to our panelists and panel of questioners. We are running out of time and we had promised you that um, the third segment will be an open forum for questions. 
Now that I look at the time and we are somewhat restricted, I'm going to use the YouTube and the FAO capacity building platform to select from among the many questions, one question that I'm going to ask of the panelists. And so um, I'm going to give each of the panelists an opportunity, starting with Ms. Karu in the order that we did the presentations. I'm going to give each of you an opportunity to respond in two minutes to this question. And um, the question is, by popular demand, how do we implement electronic transactions for agricultural businesses in countries of the region where the majority of people are satisfied with the use of physical currency vis-a-vis -vis electronic money? Is that question clear? Yes, but could you repeat the question if possible, Mr. Robertson? Okay, fine, quickly. Colleagues, how do we implement electronic transactions for agricultural businesses in countries of the region where the majority of people are satisfied with the use of physical money, that is cash, vis-a-vis -vis electronic money? Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I actually think that that is a great question. Um, while I would say that in our region, we are comfortable with cash transactions, I would say that, for example, COVID-19 has sort of changed the dynamics. And I think that um, going forward, it might change the dynamics of the world forever. I also think that um, when you're looking at, um, if you do market research and so on, while some may say that they're comfortable with um, cash transactions, if you look at millennial shoppers, many of them use credit and debit cards and use electronic forms of payment. And I think that even on a health standpoint, I believe that marketing um, agriculture online actually introduces it to a, a younger generation of persons who have normally do not shop in um, markets and so on and probably prefer to shop in supermarkets. And in essence, you're actually controlling what our local population is consuming, which in, the Latin, in Latin America and the Caribbean, we have a high incidence of um, non-communicable diseases from you know, high cholesterol, diabetes, and so on. And I think that um, in that way, I, I sort of disagree with the question. I think that it may be ageism, a bit. Um, but I do believe that many um, of the population in the Caribbean, we are continually, it's increased in the, the, the use of um, cashless transactions. And I think we just add to that. Thank you very well. much. We now go to Ms. Doyle. Oh. Ms. Doyle, over to you, please, in response to the question. Do I get an opportunity to hear the question again? <laughs> okay, quickly. How do we implement electronic transactions for agricultural businesses in countries of the region where the majority of people are satisfied with the use of physical currency, that is cash, vis-a-vis -vis electronic money? Well, I think the way to do that is always to give people information, to have them make decisions from an informed standpoint. So the just like Ms. Karu said that that might be a little ages um I will be I am also in agreement to that in some regard because yes among younger people and I would even say younger people I just think if you have the information about the benefits of a cashless system then you tend to use that option because it becomes very convenient I'm sure everybody can attest to wanting to do things and then have to go to an ATM and you may go to the ATM and there's a line. You know, it takes up a lot of time, especially in life post COVID-19. We definitely need more opportunities and more options to conduct business. And I think if we're making decisions from a place of convenience, moving with the time or being up to the time, then it is an easy sell and um, 
I think it has already started. I mean, financial tech, fintech has already started to be integrated into Caribbean living, not on a large scale like we'll see in first world countries. But I definitely think if people have the information about the convenience of fintech and going cashless, then they will utilize that option a lot more. Because I think a reason why sometimes we shy away from um, transitioning to new technologies is because we don't trust it, you know. And once there is a track record of these things being above board and trustworthy, then we'll get the persons who are, we'll call them naysayers right now, to jump on board and also utilize that option. Thank you very much, Ms. Doyle. We go to Mr. Kieran Bascom. Hi, thanks. Um, so what I, I, my comment would also complement and and Doyle's because I have, haven't had experience, you know, I I was one of those early adopters who was wanting and desperately seeking fintech. So I did sign up for WeP and whatnot. And my experience was positive in the sense that they stayed with me until it was the process was completed. I was able to I wasn't able to test the connection as I wanted in the future and then I had to change the website. But I was able to get the service. I was able to sign up. The downside is, is that it did take some time. There was a lot of back and forth. Um, I wasn't able to get the right information. So there was just room for basically what I what my presentation was about, which is proper communication, proper marketing. So VP now has to look at the onboarding process and how they are bringing in new clients. They definitely have a positive in the fact that I stayed with me and every time I call, I, 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 I spoke to the same person. So I was able to get it completed. And, you know, it's positive to have that now. But, you know, it's it's for some reasons, it may be difficult for them. You know, a lot of, a lot of farmers like people, a lot of business owners prefer a one and done kind of service. And it is this one really relies on customer relationship. You are dealing with money, even though it's electronical, so you still need to focus on customer relationship and providing that service to the customer. So yeah, that's my thank you very much. We now move to our last um respondent, Mr. Lorenzo Yearwood. Yeah, thank you very much. And I, I think the question that you asked, and please, please allow me to repeat the question you asked. The question you asked is, how do we allow those persons in Guyana who are still using donkey carts to transport lumber uh, to be more acceptable to the more, more modern vehicles like trucks and stuff to use? And my, my answer to it is to allow the transition to also naturally take place as well and not alienate those persons who may not have access to the infrastructure um, to, to, to particularly use the cash as well. It has been an experience that we've been using. Um, it, all the e-commerce platforms that I've seen, well, many of them, including um, Farm Finder, we allow the use of m in Kenya, allow the use of PayPal and other digital platforms, WooCommerce in terms of um, Barbados. Um, but I think we also do allow cash on delivery as well. And while we do accept the fact that the world is transitioning towards e-commerce and, and towards digital fintechs and stuff, um, we still should not alienate some of these persons who are very comfortable using cash. Um, I think similar to what the other panelists said, that we need to continue to educate them. Um, we need to reinforce them with uh, proper information, adequate information as well, in terms of how it can improve their operations and access to financing. But I also think there is still an element that we allow to transition quite naturally as well without eliminating their particular situation. And I do love watching the donkey carrots when they go to Guyana, by the way. I love watching it. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much. It's novel, it's traditional. Okay, we have come to the end of the third um, aspect of our webinar. And as moderator, it is my duty to extend special thanks to our four panelists or presenters and also to our three expert panelists who asked the questions. We are very enthused that you have been able to live up to the expectations of our participants. We are also heartened that you took the time off um, to participate in this, our 
10th webinar, um, FAO COVID-19 Food System Series. And we wish you all the best, and we hope that this information will also be transmitted through the various platforms, that is the, the YouTube and the FAO platforms, which I mentioned earlier. Um, persons can also have access to the information via the FAO core platform for training in public policy. And without further ado, I would like to now ask our sub-regional coordinator, Dr. Renata Clark, to bring us the closing remarks and vote of thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ruben. Our focus in this conversation has been on e-commerce, which is an extremely important issue, but it's only one aspect of digital agriculture. It has been said that data is the most important commodity of the 21st century. And you know, we see continuously improving digital technologies that really revolutionize what we can do with data. For sure, we've seen, we've heard from those very exciting presentations that it can enable market penetration for MSMEs, creating employment, generating foreign exchange. But we know that it's also an important support to resilience for Caribbean agriculture. It's an important contributor to increasing productivity. Very often, data come from everywhere and, and everyone, but benefits are disproportionately uh, enjoyed by a few. We need to make sure that there is the right foresight and guidance driving digitalization of agriculture and markets in the Caribbean to make sure that there are broad social benefits. We need educational systems that make us not only digitally literate, but digitally bold. We need an institutional and policy environment that encourages development of digital solutions. We need to enhance access to digital products and services by smallholders. And we need digital governance that ensures secure and reliable services. So we see that COVID has brought attention to something that actually deserved attention a lot sooner and deserves more constant and dedicated attention as we go forward. I'd like to join Ruben by thanking, in thanking all of you for what has been an extremely interesting discussion that I hope is just one more step as we enjoy uh, the benefits that digital agriculture and e-commerce can bring for smallholders and agriculture in the Caribbean. Back to you, Ruben. Okay, thank you very much, um, Renata. And we now bring this webinar to a close. Thank you, everyone. We had a total of 337 persons participating, and we thank you very much. And we will ensure that all those who were registered on the platform receive your certificates. And we will also have the webinar on the sites for persons who have registered so that you can have access to the information. We are also asking all of our presenters to ensure that the information presented is shared with us so that we can disseminate accordingly. Thank you, everyone. Today is a holiday in Trinidad and Tobago. It's Corpus Christi Day. Plant a tree, plan something, ensure food and nutrition security. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you very much.
Si deseas activar subtítulos en español para este webinar, haz clic en el icono de configuración en la parte inferior de la pantalla del video. Luego, selecciona Subtítulos. Haz clic en Traducción automática. Y para terminar, selecciona en la lista de idiomas Español. Con esto, ya podrás...